announcements. Our speakers tonight are Laura Marchand, uh, who is a correspondent for Le Figaro and Le Nouvel Observateur, and Guillaume Perrier, French journalist, writer, and radio reporter, uh, who has for a number of years been an Istanbul-based correspondent for Le Monde. Together, they are the authors of La Turquie et le Fantôme Arménien, now translated into English as Turkey and the Armenian Ghost on the Trail of the Genocide, published by McGill Queen's University Press just recently. Here's how tonight's program is going to work. I will read a few short passages from the book in order to give you a sense of it. Then uh, our, excuse me, our authors will speak, and then we will open things up for discussion. Uh, then we hope you'll purchase the book and stick around to have it signed by the authors while you enjoy some refreshments. That's how it's going to work. And a few brief comments before I read from the book. Uh, very interesting work. And one of the recurrent themes of Turkey and the Armenian ghost, as you shall hear, is appropriately, and not surprisingly, denial. In one of the book's chapters entitled An Obsession with Denial, the authors write, quote, The centennial of the genocide is fast approaching, even more fast now, and Turkey is worried about the international campaign that is on the drawing board. Turkey is sparing no effort to counter claims in countries with large Armenian communities. But in the run-up to 2015, the Turkish government is switching tactics. A shrewd strategist, Ahmet Davutoglu, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, now he's the uh, Prime Minister, uh, understands that over-the-top denial will be counterproductive in the long run. Thus, near the end of the book, when Mr. Davutoglu is quoted as saying, quote, we must sit down together and talk, our goal is to break the ice. Now there will be someone who will sit across from the Armenians and listen to them. I'm not the type of foreign affairs minister to say, no, nothing happened in 1915. We are preparing new messages for 2015. I don't call it a genocide, but when someone says there was one, I don't deny it. One has to note that this is a very intelligent approach. There are many ways to deny a genocide, some of them more civilized than others. And Davutoglu has found the most polished form of denial yet. All the while, of course, his government continues to support many decidedly less civilized forms of denial and funds the creation of fake history at home and abroad. Denial works in many ways, and as regards the events of 1915, we're seeing them all. In the introduction, or rather in the foreword to the book, uh, by uh, Tanner Akjam, Tanner writes, I think it is time to address the question of the genocide from a broader perspective, that of the Christians who once lived here and were annihilated. This problem is directly linked to the history of the Republic and to our very existence. The Republic was founded on the disappearance of the Christian population living in Turkey, in other words, on the annihilation of an existing entity. Since our existence was founded on the disappearance of another entity, any mention of that entity provokes fear and anxiety. In our country, the difficulty we have in speaking about the Armenian question is entrenched in the duality of being and nothingness. In the following pages, Laura Marchand and Guillaume Perrier lead us in search of an existence that has been reduced to non-existence. Holding up a mirror to our reality, they show us the traces of what no longer exists and remind us that until we free ourselves from this communicative reality, this imaginary world where we are held hostage by our own illusions, we will never find peace. In the beginning, the first chapter of the book, I think it's the first chapter of the book, The Armenian Genocide and the Law, our authors write, By exploring the living reality of the genocide and its consequences for Turkish and Armenian societies sickened by a century of denial, and by following the twisted pathways of the memory of this great crime still denied by its perpetrators, this collection of our reports and inquiries gives the lie to all those who accept historical revisionism or take lightly this ancient history. It is not our purpose to write a history book. Historians have studied the events of 1915 in great detail. There is no need for any government to convene a commission, as Turkey and its lobbyists proposed to do, to declare the truth about a subject that is no longer the subject of academic debate. The archives and documentary sources, whether those of the Ottoman Empire, now increasingly accessible, or of Germany, for example, provide sufficient evidence of the genocidal intent of the Committee of Union and Progress, the core of Turkish national power, during World War I. 
In short, we have no interest in debating the reality of the genocide. It is a fact, amply supported by the countless interviews we conducted and testimonials we collected throughout Turkey for almost a decade. The disappearance of a million and a half Armenians from modern day Turkey has left a corpse with, with gaping wounds that, like medical examiners, we examine in an attempt to give visibility to what has been erased. Outside Istanbul, the Armenian presence has, been, has almost been erased. Yet, in towns and villages throughout rural Anatolia, we collected stories and testimonials that are the best antidote to the poison of denial. We found survivors, forced converts, crypto-Armenians, so-called righteous Turks, churches and cemeteries, tools, windmills, houses, songs, and traditions that have resisted assimilation and continue to tell the story of a century of existence, of fear, and of survival. We were there not as archaeologists to dig up the past, but to learn more about the heirs to the legacy of the genocide and the contemporary manifestations of memory. Our research often took the form of a criminal investigation, a jigsaw puzzle, whose pieces gradually began to fit together. First-hand witnesses have almost all disappeared, but the story of the genocide has been passed down through words and feelings from father to son, and more often from mother to daughter. Memories of the events still resonate in every home from Istanbul to Van, from Samsun to Adana. Armenian inscriptions are overgrown with moss and obscured by years of grime, but are revealed with a little scraping. Buried bodies appear around every corner of memory. The evidence is so overwhelming that its denial clearly stems from a collective neurosis. Together, all these testimonials and reports of the still fresh traces of the 1915 genocide reveal the degree to which Turkey is haunted by the ghost of a murdered people. As long as it is denied by Ankara, the memory of the 1915 genocide cannot be laid to rest. Can you build peace over a gaping wound, heal, be heal memories by trampling bodies? The answer is clearly no. As demonstrated by Vidal Naquet, historical revisionism is the continuation of genocide, its final, most sophisticated phase. In Assassins of Memory, Essays on the Denial of the Holocaust, he defined Holocaust denial as, quote, an attempt to exterminate on paper that takes over from the physical extermination. The same mechanism is at work in the Armenian Genocide. Through denial, Turkey perpetuates the extermination process. Go to, I think, the next chapter about someone many of us know. The title of the chapter is Armin Aroyan, Archaeologist of the Genocide. How many people have traveled with Armin Aroyan? In the room? Yeah. Quite a few. Yeah. Twice. <laughs> the group gathered at tea time in the Sultan, the Sultan Ahmet Hotel in Istanbul's tourist district. It was time to meet their guide. A white-haired 60-something Armenian in a plaid shirt and suspended khaki pants, Armin Aroyan is a romantic character, a detective out of a crime novel. For the past 20 years, he has been organizing custom tours for the descendants of genocide survivors, searching for souvenirs, details of their family's past, traces of their existence, and, above all, their identity. His tours are attracting more and more Armenians from the diaspora, visitors to a Turkey that is gradually opening up and becoming more accessible. Aroyan began his travels for personal reasons. I first came to Turkey in the 1980s, he says. I had my own history to explore. When I returned to California, I shared my discoveries. My grandmother had often talked about life in Eintab, about the beauty of the place. She always said it had the juiciest fruit, that life there was so sweet. I grew up hearing about those places, but I had always been curious to see them. Born in Cairo to a family that had fled Eintab near Syria during the genocide, Aroyan moved to California as a child. There the family found a sizable Armenian community, especially around Fresno. Aroyan studied engineering and began a successful career with McDonnell Douglas, the aircraft manufacturer. But in 1990, just before his 50th birthday, he was laid off. Perhaps it was a sign, he says with a smile. By the following year, I had begun organizing trips for groups of Armenians. Since then, Aroyan has traveled the length and breadth of Turkey, making four or five trips a year. He takes his groups from village to village on the trail of Armenians who survived or disappeared. From the front of a minibus seated next to his faithful driver, Cemal, a Turk from Aintab, Aroyan crisscrosses the country from west to east. His business runs like clockwork now. In Los Angeles, he prepares a custom itinerary based on the wish lists of his clients. A few days in Istanbul, plus visits to some of the high points of Armenian heritage, Van, Karpert, or Ani. But his clients are most interested in finding traces of their own history. 
Everyone who has undertaken this journey has found something, he says, a house, a school, a vineyard. Some have reconnected with a long-lost branch of the family. The next morning, Aroyan and his memory tourists set out to explore the neighboring villages. This is near... Sivas. Near Sivas, thank you. Twenty kilometers east, they drive through Kochisar, once home to a prison with a sinister reputation, and on to Govun and Hafik, former Armenian towns. They then reach Duz Duziala, the former Khokhon, with its buried church. Before the ge genocide, half of its 300 inhabitants were Armenian. A few survivors returned to the village and stayed until the 1960s. The Nishans left for Istanbul in October 1964, according to the village elders. And now, asked Saroyan, there's no one left? It takes some time to get a clear answer, but after an hour of chatting, the old Turk suddenly recalled that an Armenian by the name of Hovagin still lives in those parts, and the visitors set off to find him. Half an hour later, the old hermit dressed in, an old hermit dressed in rags hobbles into view, bent almost double over his cane. The old man, who they learned is 85, is surprised to be addressed in Armenian. He mustn't speak Armenian here. It's too dangerous, he cries. But he continues talking in Armenian as Aroyan questions him. My name is Ovagim Karagosyan, but forget the Yan. They took it off. Now it's just Karagos. No, I'm not married. I live alone. I own nothing at all, not even a change of clothes. No, I have no family. I had a brother and a sister, but they left a long time ago. His eyes clouded with cataracts. He gazes fearfully around as if caught in the grip of unspeakable terror. If I talk too much, they'll cut off my head. Take me with you, and I'll tell you everything. <laughs> then he asks fearfully, but who are those people behind you? What are they thinking? What will they do to me? The small group of members of the Armenian diaspora stands mute before the old man, the living incarnation of the pain that is their legacy. Their encounter with this Armenian descendant of genocide survivors living alone in his village without being Islamized is a shock. Tears running down her cheeks, Nicole slips a few bills into Hovagim's hand and squeezes it. Then the minibus sets off again. From the chapter, Converts, the Hidden Armenians. From this large Kurdish city in southeastern Turkey, that is, in southeastern Turkey, that is the Arabic here, we catch a taxi to the neighboring town of Batman. Who are you? Where are you going? Where are you from? Where are you going? The friendly 30-something driver reels off to the traditional litany of questions asked of any foreigner. In return, we ask whether he might by any chance be Armenian. There are so many in this region. Oh no, I'm a good Muslim, he replies quickly. Indeed, the visible evidence is all there. A closely cropped beard, a miniature Quran suspended from the rearview mirror that jerks up and down at every pothole, and on the back window of his yellow Renault, a wide, may Allah protect us, sticker. For a few kilometers, he concentrates on the road. Then, I'm a good Muslim, but it's true that on our mother's side we're Armenian. <laughs> really? After a few more kilometers, staring at an imaginary white line, in fact, on my father's side, we're also Armenian. <laughs> so everyone is, an, is Armenian then? He switches lanes, passes a tractor, then, well, yes, actually. Inevitably, some converts have tried so hard to hide their Armenian roots to relieve... Sorry, I skipped a paragraph. Sunday, 19 September 2010, near the eastern border of Turkey, not far from Iran, hundreds of joyful Armenians, mostly from Istanbul, pile into boats headed for the Holy Cross Akhtamar Church, a small architectural gem built in the 10th century on an island in Lake Van. For the first time since 1915, the Turkish government has authorized the holding of a religious service there. The service will be led by Aram Ateshyan, the deputy patriarch who has come from Istanbul and whose family also includes converts to Islam. The building is not large enough to hold all the faithful, and plastic chairs have been set up outside. Some neighboring farmers have also arrived, picnicking off to one side. Officially, they are Kurds, but their presence alone is enough to raise doubts about that. Sitting under a tree is an old man wearing the embroidered cap of a haji, the distinctive mark of a Muslim who has made a pilgrimage to Mecca, and wearing a pair of shalbar, the traditional baggy pants worn by Anatolian peasants. Suspended in the tree above him is a loudspeaker from a from which a crackling hymn is blasting at full volume. Is he Armenian? Oh no, I'm a Kurd, he says. Next to him, a younger man, his nephew, bursts into laughter. No, he's a Donman. Why else would we have traveled three hours to attend a service? <laughs> Inevitably, some converts have tried so hard to hide their Armenian roots, to relieve the social pressure or simply to save their lives, that they have become completely assimilated. Becoming more Turkish than a Turk was the best way to survive. Implacable, 
and insidious, time has been denial's best ally. Ari tells us about one of his uncles. He's very pious. As soon as he hears the call to prayers, he hurries to the mosque. During the festival of sacrifice, he slaughters a sheep. Who would ever guess that he and his wife speak to each other in Armenian, or that they visit us on Christian religious holidays? No one. The rural exodus to Istanbul has helped the Armenians to cover their tracks and lose themselves in the anonymity of a city of 14 million inhabitants. Ne neighbors know nothing about one's family tree. Externally, Ari's uncle has retained a single clue to his hidden identity. He's a jeweler. But his daughter has buried hers beneath her kador and does not want to hear ab about her impious origins. When you do everything in your power to bury the past, your children become nationalist and religious, Ari says. Okay, I'm going to stop there for now and give the microphones to our authors. And please welcome our authors, Guillaume and Laura Perrier. Uh, okay. to talk about our book with the Armenians from uh, American diaspora. Till now, we knew Armenians from Turkey, hidden ones and official ones. We often meet the diaspora in France, but it's the first time we have the opportunity to meet the American diaspora. Diaspora. This week, diaspora. Diaspora. Diaspora, yes. Sorry for the French accent. Yeah, sorry for the French accent. Um, <laughs> Uh, this weekend, we took part to Responsibility 2015 conference in New York. Tuesday, uh, we were in New Jersey, uh, where we met um, the, the Armenian community, and now we are with you tonight. Right into the microphone. Okay. So our book has, gen has just been translated into English and has just been published by McGill University. We discovered it this weekend, so we are, we are, we are really happy with it and really proud of it. And uh, it, ha it had been published in France two years ago. Uh, two years ago, yes. And since then, uh, since we wrote that book, we, we keep working on the Armenian genocide. Uh, for instance, for instance, a film Berlin like that. A film documentary and a graphic novel will come out in two weeks in France. It's about a story about Varoujan Artin, is an Armenian from Marseille, and um, he has an archive center uh, in Marseille, a little bit li li like your place here. And last year, he turned back to Turkey for the first time, and we went, um, we followed him. And uh, it was his first time, and we, he went to Diyarbakir to, to make an exhibition, and then he visited the village of his grandfather. Um, but, okay, it's another story, but just to, um, to tell you that we are now deeply involved in the uh, Armenian question, I mean. And so, to begin with, let's say a few words about us. We are French journalists. We've just settled back to Paris six months ago. And before that move, we spent almost 10 years in Turkey. Uh, we lived in Istanbul. And we worked there as correspondent for French media. And um, during 10 years, we, we wrote about many issues, EU negotiations, political internal affairs, the rise of Erdogan, the Kurdish question, economic issues, minorities and human rights issues, religion, and so on. Uh, we travel outside Turkey, to Cyprus, to Greece, to Iraq, to Armenia, of course, and to, to what did I say? Syria. Syria also, and also all over Turkey, from Diyarbakir to Trabzon, from Kayseri, 
to Adana, from Bursa to 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 Mersin, so and we have to say that. Before coming to Turkey, we had a specific interest for the Armenian genocide because, as you know, uh, in 2001, in France, a law uh, in France recognized the genocide. Mm -hmm. And also, me, for instance, before going to Turkey, I had met a survivor uh, in Paris. Um, he had very few memories about, um, about the genocide. He was in the desert in Syria at that time with, with her with her sister, and he told me uh, his story. Um, and maybe we are also interested in the Armenian genocide just because we are French. What I mean is that in, in France, um, at school, we are, we are taught a lot about the, the Holocaust. So as a result, we are, mis we, we are also interested in the other genocide. We have a specific maybe spe sensibility for, for the genocide. But to tell the truth, uh, before going to Turkey, uh, we must admit we didn't know much about, uh, about the genocide, the Armenian genocide. Uh, none of us have uh, Armenian roots. And when coming to Turkey, we were really far uh, from thinking we will investigate the Armenian genocide consequences in the Turkey today during several years and that we will be with you tonight to talk uh, about this experience. So, let me just introduce you the, the French original version of, uh, of the book. Um, uh, <coughs> Le fantôme arménien, uh, Armenian ghost. So, why the ghost? Um, it took quite a long to, to find a good title to, to that book, but with the picture it was more obvious. Um, this is a picture. Uh, it was taken by our friend, photographer Antoine Agudian. Uh, you may know his words. Um, we traveled together a lot in uh, in remote regions of Turkey, and this one this one was taken in Dersim, in a small village. This is Ergen Church. Uh, it's a 11th century church, I mean the remaining of, of the church. Um, and this old lady uh, was from this village, and she was walking very slowly in front of the church. And Antoine took took this picture without knowing who she was. And two years later, we came back to the village. And we learned that she was also a hidden Armenian. Uh, so, and she's still living because I still met her some months ago, and uh, she's she's in very good condition. Um, so, this 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 pictures uh, this picture is um, symbolize uh, the Armenian ghost. What what do we call the Armenian ghost? Of course, we don't call ghosts the living Armenians. Uh, it's a symbolic figure. Uh, what we call the Armenian ghost is the, the remnants, the memory of 1915. Uh, all the Armenians and their heritage, culture, language were supposed to be almost erased from Anatolia. But after a while we understood that it was not. Uh, it was not at all. It was only a project of the Turkish state. It is still, in a way. But the authorities never succeeded. Not only the memory of the presence of Armenians is still vivid in some regions, but we had in the recent years what we can call an Armenian revival in Turkey. Um, so haunting ghosts was already an evidence for Armenians uh, in Turkey and all over the world, because Turkey refuses to recognize the genocide and worst made denialism a state ideology. Um, but what was less known, in fact, is that the Armenian ghost also haunts Turkey and Turkish society. In fact, Turkey is kind of obsessed with the genocide memory. And because of its deni denial, the issue is coming back into the face of Turks, like a boomerang. Uh, as soon as they question of official history, state ideology or identity. Uh, the more Turkey tries to deny, and to erase the traces of the past, the more it has to deal with embarrassing, embarrassing questions. Let me just give you one example. As you know, 24th of April 2005 will be the centennial day. Armenians all around the world are waiting for that day and hope to put more pressure on Turkey. But Turkey also, Turkey also waits for that day uh, with more anxiety. 
in hopes uh, that President Obama will not use the G word, the G word, that President Hollande will not uh, try again to pass a law to to um, uh, to criminalize denial. Um, a huge ceremony will happen in Yerevan, of course, with lots of mm -hmm. chiefs of state. Um, but more worrying for Turkish authorities, thousands of people, Turks and Armenians, will uh, come together to commemorate the genocide in Turkey, in more than 20 cities around the country. The denial state needed to light a counter fire to, uh, to, to hide this. Uh, and this is what they will do in Çanakkale, in Gallipoli this year. Um, because, as you know, uh, on 24th of April, they will organize a huge military ceremony for uh, the battle that uh, happened on 25th of April. So they try again to rewrite the history uh, to try to hide uh, the genocide. Uh, one interesting aspect of that is uh, that on the official brochure uh, that has been published in Ankara and printed thousands of times, uh, a bureaucrat chose a picture to illustrate uh, the, the monument of Gallipoli. But this bureaucrat made a meaningful, con meaningful confusion. He took a picture of Yerevan genocide monument. <laughs> a fantastic lapsus. <laughs> That shows how the ghost is haunting Turkey today. <laughs> we landed, as Laura explained, we landed in Turkey 10 years ago. It was the beginning of 2005. Uh, the issue of uh, the Armenian genocide was hardly emerging among academic circles in Turkey. Uh, you had Agos newspaper, Aras publishing house, both founded in the 90s by left-wing Armenians. They opened the debate of, uh, on the Armenian identity in Turkey. This was the context at the beginning of the years 2000. But after, um, after a short period, um, very short period, we, we were there since, since months, so some months, uh, we were literally plunged into the bath of Armenian memory. It made us understand how crucial it was uh, to uh, analyze uh, the Turkish politics. And the Armenian genocide was, in fact, in 2005, uh, a political issue of the highest importance. Two events showed that. Um, that year, for the first time, a top-level academic conference was organized in Istanbul and dedicated to the Armenians. The title was very cautious, of course, Armenians at the end of the Ottoman Empire. But it was a way to test the authorities. The state's reaction came quickly from the mouth of Cemil Cicek, then uh, Justice Ministry and spokesman of the government. He is now the President of the National Assembly. And he said that Turkey, because of those intellectuals, Turkey had been stabbed in the back. The government tried, of course, his best to prevent the conference. Uh, it was... Uh, prevented to be organized in Boazici University, which is the best public university in the country. But at the end, month, uh, some months after, it was organized, it could be organized in another one, in Bilgi University, a private university of Istanbul. The participants, among them Randing, Hassan Jemal, such people, they were welcome with eggs and tomatoes. Uh, a group of deep state ultra-nationalists was at the entrance shouting, insulting everybody. Um, we recognized uh, famous people. People became later famous, like Kemal Kerinçtis, who, who would be a, a top suspect in the Argenikon case uh, two years later. Um, the, the reaction of the state was um, came also with trials open again uh, some of the organizers. Uh, they were accused of insulting Turkishness because of this conference with the famous 301 article of the Penal Code. The second event <coughs> that year was the interview given by uh, novelist Oran Pamuk to a Swiss newspaper. Mm. He said that 1 million Armenians and 30,000 Kurds have been killed in, in this country. And for that, he also uh, had a court case opened uh, because of insulting Turkishness. Again, the 301 article. But this, uh, this case helped 
helped more than ever to raise the issue of the recognition of the Armenian genocide. The court case opened in 2006. Laura and me were inside the room um, attending all this theater. It was a show. Thousands of people inside and outside. Um, a complete mess. Uh, we had European observers, supporters of both sides, journalists, militants in the Shishli court. And Oran Pamuk was terrified. He could see all the violence of the judicial Turkish system uh, appearing in front of him. The state reaction said that day a lot uh, for us uh, about the persistence of the taboo and the guilt of Turkish society. After these two events, <coughs> the Armenian ghost for us will never stop to be on the political agenda. The years 2000, in fact, are marked with this double trend, which is at first, uh, at first sight conflicting. Uh, on one hand, we have this revival of Armenian identity that becomes visible again, and uh, on the other hand, the persistence of an obsessional denial that penetrates institutions, political speech, education, media and society. Negative or positive, the attitude toward Armenians is always related with the memory of the genocide, what we call the Armenian ghost. The first aspect, as I said, the Armenian revival, um, it's obvious today, uh, it appears uh, um, at, at every occasion, uh, before elections, during Gezi Pak protests in 2013, for example, or at the border of Syria, uh, now uh, where uh, the war is, is waged, um, around Injilik, NATO, NATO air base, we always have this Armenian ghost coming back. Um, the context, of course, the political context is more favorable. Let's come back to 2005. Then Turkey opened the negotiations with the EU and Turkey was determined to, to make some of the necessary reforms, including freedom of speech on that particular aspect. Political alternance between the military and the Islamists uh, allowed new hopes, because the army was still the guardian of the dogma on all historical issues. And Islamists were supposed to be more liberals. They were supported by liberals and intellectuals who, that time, bet on an EU agreement to democratize the country and to solve the identity problems. The confrontation between the old school Kemalists and the AKP of uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, could be seen around Ardamar Church opening in 2007. As you can remember, the, the church was open but without the cross on the top of its roof. This was because the uh, Turkish army put its veto on it, uh, despite the will of the Turkish government. Of course, Turkish authorities never supported or approved the recognition of the Armenian genocide. But they don't prevent some people, a small group of people, to, to say it. Um, some well-known intellectuals um, used the opportunity uh, to, to question the official history. Uh, some of them launched a campaign to apologize to their Armenian brothers. It was in 2008, and 30,000 people signed this, this petition. Um, that's also the period when the first public commemorations appeared uh, in Istanbul on 24th of April. Uh, thanks to two groups of activists, uh, one of them is IHD, Human Rights Association, led by Eren Keskin and Ayşe Günaysu. Uh, the other one around a ghost newspaper, around Dual Day Association and Rounding's Friends. The Kurds also played a role in this evolution. After 2007, they started to question also the official history that made them, too, a second-class identity, just like it happened to Armenians one century before. Finally, the assassination of Ronding in 2007 was the catalyst of this Armenian revival. The murderers nested somewhere in st inside the state, produced the opposite effects of what they intended. This new context allowed uh, hidden Armenians and Islamite Armenians to come out and carefully reveal their identity and we will give the, 
microphone to Laura to talk about this part. Yes, ten years ago, hidden Armenians were, were known in Turkey, but mainly historically, uh, there were very few information about the descendants uh, of Armenians in Turkey today. Uh, th there are two main reasons for that. Uh, first, in the diaspora, uh, these Islamized Armenians or hidden Armenians, whatever you call them, had no official existence. Uh, official history had put them among the dead. Uh, even if at the family level they were sometimes known, for instance, in France we have some stories um, of Armenian families who kept some links with their Turkish relatives, but these links were kept inside the private sphere. Secondly, in Turkey, uh, hidden Armenians were bound to keep silent their identity because there were a really strong hostility toward them, uh, either from the state or locally. Um, so as a result, the awareness of their existence was strictly, strictly limited. Uh, the daily I was used to mention them a little bit, but at that time its circulation was small and remained in the Armenian community uh, in Istanbul. And Hunting also used to talk about them, but his talk about them was barely inaudible. And one anecdote in 2005 is revealing about the atmosphere uh, at that time. Uh, we had just come to Istanbul as journalists and I had an interview with a journalist from Marmara, an Armenian newspaper in Istanbul. And really I knew nothing about hidden Armenians, so I asked, but out of the Armenian community in Istanbul, are there really no more Armenians in Anatolia? And I was answered by this Armenian journalist, no, the only Armenians you will find in Anatolia are in, are in mass graves. But slowly, slowly, because of the circumstances, as, uh, political circumstances uh, being described, uh, hidden Armenians started to appear openly. Um, and so, Liam didn't mention it. Uh, it's true that Fethiye Chetin's book was a turning point, definitely. Uh, some stories which used to be whispered, whispered behind closed door or on a deathbed became public for the first time. But these one children, uh, Fethiye Chetin um, talk about, have generally just one grandparent with Armenian blood. And even for them, who are also Turk or Kurd, say it publicly, is very difficult. And after Fethiye Chetin uh, published her first book, uh, the, the, the book of my grandmother, she, she published another book with Ayşe Gülal Tanay, who is a Turkish academician. They collected in that book around 20 stories of grandchildren who had an Armenian grandparent. But for that book, they collected dozens of st similar stories all around Turkey. But the majority of them, and, uh, you, you have to tell them, so, to tell me sorry if you don't hear, if I, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, the majority of them refused their story to be published even, even if their name was kept totally secret. So it means that fear is always there. So this process of public recognition is very new, but even if there are not so many, a few hidden Armenians stated publicly. But as it was just six years ago when we met the first family of hidden Armenians, and at that time, which them was really difficult. Uh, this family lived in a suburb of Istanbul. They agreed to meet me because their relative asked for it, but they ask for I don't ask their name and that their address not to be told, which I accepted, of course. And after that, they talk freely and it was really instructive because there were three generations uh, in that family and each of them had a different attitude toward their hidden identity. Uh, the grandmother was a white Kurdish traditional veil. She didn't want her some she didn't want her hidden identity to be publicly known. She was really worried it could just bring her some troubles onto all the family. Then her son was the chief of the family, he was around 45. And this evening, uh, the whole family was around the table for dinner and he said a prayer before eating. 
made a Christian prayer. Maybe because I was there, but uh, he said it. Uh, but the neighborhood didn't know uh, at all about that. And in, the, and in its working life, he didn't say a word about it. Um, he had a store of, um, of windows, and, and there he was a Muslim uh, fasting during Ramadan. Uh, lastly, her daughter was around 20, 25 years old. Uh, as a work, she had to restore work of art. And she said her colleagues, she was Armenian, and that she had, and she had asked them to call her Karin, the new name she had chosen. And it was not a problem at all for, the, for her Turkish colleagues to call her Karin and that she was an Armenian, they didn't care at all. So she also planned to become Christian and find an Armenian husband, but an official one, not a hidden one. <laughs> so with her story, uh, one can understand that, let's say, a warm context allowed the, the hidden identity to become visible again. And as we have just seen it, this uh, family live in Istanbul, so the anonymity Anonymity uh, of the big towns help uh, hidden Armenian. They don't face the, the, the pressure uh, there is, uh, they can face in villages. And outside at work, private identity is not under pressure of collective identity. In Turkey, there is even a specific uh, word for it. It is called Mahale Baskosu. It means pressure of the neighborhood and everybody uh, faces it, not only Armenians. And so for hidden uh, identity, for hidden Armenian to, to come out uh, locally, political context is also a key factor. Uh, it also has to be benevolent and Diyarbakir is a very good example for it. Uh, the municipality is run by the Kurdish party, the party for peace and democracy. At the national parliament, this party is the only one uh, asking for the state to recognize, to recognize the genocide. So locally, the municipality concretely supports Armenian history and heritage. And the new restoration of Sop Geragoska church makes the historical presence of Armenians visible again. And because the political environment is friendly, visit the monument becomes something really common in the area. Tourism by locals increase, increases very much, and from time to time we can see a veiled woman who lights a candle. So it means it's a way to leave its identity again, even partially, because maybe these people are also Muslim. Uh, but it means that this identity has not been totally forgotten. Dersim region, which is in the, also in the east part of Turkey, is also interesting to observe how hidden Armenians come out again. And the majority of the population of this region is Alevite. Uh, they belong to a liberal branch of Shiism, and they are also discriminated by the Turkish state. So, like the Kurds, uh, they suffer from assimilation attempts, and because of that, they are likely to be more tolerant towards hidden Armenians. There is a kind of identification process. So today in Turkey, there are several ways to, for Armenian identity to come out again. Uh, religion is one of them. There are a few baptisms, but till now, uh, they are strictly limited. They are really marginal. Um, coming, coming out with its Armenian identity is easier through culture. Uh, for instance, uh, around 60 persons attended Armenian language course organized by Diyarbakir Diyama municipality. So in the society, in the Kurdish society, uh, Armenian language course is much more accepted than come back to Christianity. And we have other, there are also other options to to, to come out with, is, uh, with its identity. It can be done by changing its name. Uh, that's what Miran did. Um, his name used to be Selaitin um, Gultekin. He went to court to have its name changed and judge, Turkish judge, accepted it. And uh, his new family name is Pirgic now. 
And Milan became fully aware of its Armenian roots just five years ago. And since then, he dedicates himself to the Armenian questions. But it means that you really have to have a very strong personality to be, to be able to face Turkish administration. And Miran has really a very strong personality. And let's say a word of the... No, oh, okay. So all these stories uh, help to understand how hidden Armenians come out, but they do say nothing about those who are still too afraid to talk. Um, local environment is, a sh is essential, as I mentioned it a little bit earlier. And I met a man in Sasson. He told me all the family's field had been stolen during the genocide, except a very small one. And this man was still harassed by the members of the tribe who had taken the fields one century ago. And to escape them, he sees no other option than migrating to Istanbul to protect his family. And what was terrible, he said, oh, those who harass me, they are just waiting for my departure to grab the small field. And lastly, we cannot say anything about the Armenian identity of those who look totally Turkified. Are they totally assimilated? Some of them are, but some of them are not. But till now, they, they keep silent. silence. And there are numerous stories of women of Armenian descent wearing an, a chador of men going to Mecca, even imams. And I, I've heard a um, a very interesting story. Uh, a man told me that during the 80s uh, he was in jail in, in Adyaman because he was at that time a PKK activist. And when he was in jail, um, members of his family used to, to visit, to come to, and visit him. And then he realized that when these this relatives used to uh, came, they also came to visit another people, an, another man, he was a cousin, and this cousin was in jail because um, he was a member of an Islamist organization, uh, Idadje, and he, he, was, he had been condemned because of, um, because of a terror attack in Orfa in the 80s. So we can see that in a, in the same family, we can have someone who come out with his ident uh, ident uh, ident uh, uh, identity, and in the other part, we can have somebody who totally refuses it. And, and just to, to end with uh, hidden Armenians, uh, there is one question everybody is interest, uh, wants to, to ask, usually is how many uh, hidden Armenians are there in Turkey? Uh, really, we do not know. Uh, it's impossible to know. but. Turkish state does know. Um, uh, it has become clear that um, Turkish state uh, keep um, has kept um, sorry. records. <laughs> has kept records, and uh, several stories give credential to the thesis that Turkish uh, exactly know who are the citizens with Armenian roots. And we have several stories about that. I remember a young girl, she told me she went to uh, army administration to ask for a document for, for his father. And she saw the word foreigner was written in front of his father's name in the register. And we had another story in Lidje. Um, Abdurrahim uh, Demirjian um, managed to get an official document from the registry office, uh, and this document was not to be public. And the religion of his grandparents is labeled as Christian, and Islam is written for his father only. So this is about the Armenian revival we try to, to explain. Uh, of course, the other side of the ghost is the denial. Uh, I won't be long too much on that because you, you know uh, extensively the, the consequences of denial uh, here and Mark already read some, some extracts. Um, but I would like to just to, to give you some examples of that. 
to, to show that the Turkish state still uses a sophistic, sophisticated denial machine, what Taner Aksham uh, called the denialism industry. Um, this is still a reality when you look at Turkish institutions, of course, and it was reactivated after uh, recognition by France in 2001. Uh, there is a good example with that, uh, uh, an institution, a uh, high committee called Asim Kaka, uh, it means high committee uh, to struggle against uh, Ar Armenian allegations of so-called genocide. Uh, and it, uh, it's under National Security Council umbrella and puts together the military, justice, interior, education and foreign affairs ministries. Uh, we can also mention uh, the uh, uh, Committee uh, for Turkish History, founded by Ataturk, uh, that has uh, Armenian Affairs Department. This is also true for the MFA. Dozens of diplomats around the world uh, are employed to feed the denial machine. We faced this machine sometimes with law also. Um, when the law, uh, anti-denial law was discussed in France in 2010, um, we were somewhere in uh, southeast, I think we were. I, I was in uh, in Urfa or in Gaziantep, something like that, and we received an invitation by uh, by the government to to go to Ankara. In fact, it was not really an invitation, but an order. Um, <laughs> we had to be briefed by some gentlemen at the national assembly about the Armenian question. Uh, and we were in front of uh, 10 MPs, uh, member of the three main parties, AKP, uh, CHP, the Kemalists, and MHP, the ultra-nationalists. And we had such people like uh, Colonel Turkesh Granson, uh, Yusuf Alacholu, very famous denialist, and the uh, former ambassador in Paris, uh, Osman Koroturk, uh, who is now an MP from uh, the Kemalist party. We also had uh, Prime Minister Erdogan's spokesman. So it shows, and it's again uh, an issue of higher importance for, uh, for Turkish government, because they, they, they thought they had to put the maximum pressure on French journalists to, to pass the message to the government. Of course it didn't work and it gave us more uh, reasons to write this book. <laughs> <laughs> this, this bureaucratic machine also needed an action action squad to, to provoke foreign countries. This was the purpose of the Talat Pasha Committee, a radical extension of the state policy. Uh, former President Suleiman Demirel, Turkish Cypriot nationalist leader Rauf Dengtash, and nationalist militant Do Berinçek were among the leading figures of this squad. Their actions were celebrations for Talat in Berlin, demonstration in Bastille Square in Paris, and the famous provocation against anti-denial law in Switzerland. This was, of course, a state plan, deliberate plan. Um, because the, you may not know, but uh, before Perinchek, the first provocation came from Egemen Bush, uh, then European Affairs Minister. He denied the genocide in Switzerland, but as a minister, he could not be prosecuted. So that's why uh, Turkish state sent then uh, Do Perinchek to, to do the job. Denial and anti-Armenian insult remains really common in uh, for Turkish politicians. Gezi Park protesters were labelled seeds of Armenians. Prime Minister Erdogan recently criticised the, the opposition and said, I quote him, can you imagine they even called me an Armenian? <laughs> Denial means, as we know, the continuation of the genocide without justice. The perpetrators uh, can feel a load to reoffend. We had such examples in the recent years. First of all, rounding assassination, of course. We all know the story, and eight years after, there is still no justice. The murderers um, are high members of the state bureaucracy and still um, occupy uh, high posts. Um, the murderer, Ogun Samast, was just a 70-year-old nationalist from the city of Trabzon. He was coming from for the very first time in Istanbul when he, he shot Randik. 
and it was supported by, by a very well uh, organization, uh, organized squad. Another very meaningful event happened in, happened in 2011. On 24th of April that year, uh, we were on Taksim Square for the ceremonies when we learned that a young soldier was killed in, uh, during in his military service in the region of Batman. People were gathering in Taksim, but the young Sevak Balakshu could not be there. He had been killed by another soldier uh, on that day of remembrance. Every Armenian immediately understood the meaning of that. Funerals were organized three days later in a church in Shishli in Istanbul. Ministers came, army chiefs came. To add to the offense, the coffin of Sevak came with the Turkish flag on it, and he was declared a Turkish martyr. And his father had to kiss the Turkish flag. It appeared later that the murderer was an ultra-nationalist militant from a small party called BBP. Of course, Turkish government and the army immediately said it was an accident, even before any investigation could be conducted. And after a three-year-long uh, three trial in front of a military court in Diyarbakir, the same con conclusion came, an accident. Like in 1915, when deported Armenians accidentally died en route to Syrian deserts. Last example is the fate of Sevan Nishanyan, one of the most brilliant intellectuals in Turkey. A specialist of Turkish language, graduated from Yale, a compulsive writer, he also decided to build guest houses in a tiny Greek village, Shirinje, in western Turkey. That was a way to protect the memory of the past, of course. But since the beginning he was harassed by the Turkish state, more than 20 court cases, arrests, investigations against his illegal constructions. This seems ironic in a country where two-thirds of the buildings are illegal. And in a country where uh, construction, construction tycoons made uh, billions of dollars uh, with illegal construction thanks to the government in the last 10 years. But Sevan Nishanyan is now in jail uh, since more than a year and an order to demolish his beautiful guest houses just came last week. So this is again, um, it shows the, the harassment um, going on against Armenians uh, who speak loud in this country. So to conclude, I just would remind that these two realities, these two faces of the ghost, um, are really struggling uh, themselves in, in, in Turkey now, and Turkey struggles with its own history. You cannot separate the, the gentle uh, face of the ghost with the, the bad one. Um, Next month we will have Gallipoli denial its ceremonies and at the same time the civil society will uh, unite for recognition in more than 20 cities. So um, the Armenian ghost will haunt the country in Gallipoli and somewhere else uh, in the country. And uh, until there is a recognition, of course, there will be a struggle for, for the Armenian identity and at the same time a resistance by the nationalists. Thank you. Thank you. Before we invite people, urge people to check out the book, please take some questions. Yes? Yes, please. Yes. Um, this book came out in 20, 2013. Since then, you've been living in Istanbul, right? Has there been any reaction to this book there and, and we so didn't mention did? sorry you, you went, <laughs> we didn't mention that the book was published in Turkey too it was okay. translated into Turkish and last it year has published been translated. yes that was my next yes. question yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what been, has been the reaction of the Turkish people okay so it, it has been released last year in Turkey and what is interesting is that we had no reaction uh, no no attacks uh, so we are we are not troubled uh, in Turkey because of what we have written. Uh, um, so we, you, we write quite extensively about the Armenian genocide in uh, several newspapers, and we have no we, we have no trouble with that. Uh, 
So it means there is an evolution, because it means that 10 years ago, uh, or 15 years ago, let's say 15 years ago, it would have been almost impossible to write such things. We just had some comments and a uh, column from a nationalist uh, yes. a writer in some Turkish newspapers. They called us neo and orientalist, something like sure, that. But sorry, yeah. no, nothing yeah, unusual. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, no, no death threats, so it's okay. Yeah, the book was translated into Turkish. Yes. Has it been sold well? As far as Turks read, uh, we, we don't know much, but it's like 1,500 copies, which, which is not that bad for Turkey. Yes. Yeah, what prompted you to decide to explore this chapter of our new history? <laughs> what was the reason? The reason actually is quite simple. I think it's just because, um, or one of the reasons, is because we are journalists. Um, I mean, when we came to Turkey, uh, Armenian, Armenian question, the Armenian genocide, um, was at the political agenda. Oran Pamuk was put on trial. Um, nationalism, nationalist reactions were really out towards uh, the confluence in Bilgi, um, one thing for sure, uh, and then has been assassinated. So we understood that this old story, which happened one century ago, was not an old story for Turkey, and that it was um, something really important for for Turkey could become a democracy. Uh, that's why we. We had a big, at, at first we had a big interest uh, for that issue. We understood for Turkey, today, it was of highest importance. Yes, John. Are you uh, going to go back to Turkey? And if so, do you feel safe going back there? I'm going there next week, so yes. <laughs> um, yes, we do. We do, because all the books about Armenian genocide have been published now in Turkey, including Raymond Kevorkian's books. So I think, yes, we, we, we can do that. Judy? Yes, um, there is a group of there is a group of people who are going to Turkey to um, uh, commemorate April 24th in Istanbul um, from the United States and maybe from other countries too. So uh, what do you think of their presence in Turkey? What kind of impact do you think that will have? In Turkey? I think it's very important. Um, the, this Armenian revival can be possible if people from inside come out, but also if people from outside uh, come back to their land and uh, reclaim also their own history on the land. I think it's, uh, it's a major uh, evolution also uh, in, in this context and it, all this could happen also because Armenians from Europe and from the US came back, as we described, with Armen Aryan and such people. Uh, they were pioneers uh, who could open a new, uh, a new bridge into the, the denial, so I think it's, it's a very important step. Yes, all these trips uh, make Armenian um, reality visible again, so it's part of the evolution uh, we, we see. The, we have been... Um, uh, we, did this uh, recent evolution. I, know. I have a question about uh, the issue of the hidden Armenians. Uh, maybe it's a question or maybe it's one of those long rambling statements that people make. But um, you mentioned that, uh, I, or maybe you were quoting Aisha Gulavaltanai, that this issue was silenced in the Armenian diaspora. I would question that. Uh, there's some truth to it, but in the 1920s, laws were passed to prevent Armenians from returning to Turkey. For the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, until quite recently, uh, other than Istanbul, Turkey was essentially sealed off from most diaspora Armenians. What alternative was there? Were they going to go to 
Sivas and have a family reunion with their hidden Armenian relatives? Were they going to uh, place an advertisement in Hurriyet saying, where are my hidden Armenian relatives? So I, I, I have a problem, I guess, with equating Turkey's silence on this issue no. with a diaspora It's not silence. equal, of course. It's not equal, but we, we know people from the diaspora who started visiting Turkey in the 60s or so. Yes. There are some. It's true. Um, uh, very few, but, but of uh, course. At that time, it's... it was really difficult to go there. But no, it was just to say that officially, um, hidden Armenians did, didn't exist. But um, in the private sphere, sometimes it was known that there, there are two pictures, two, two different levels. Uh, and even if it was really difficult, to, difficult to go there, uh, in France, we have some stories of people who who used to write some letters to yeah. to their hidden Armenians, to their Turkish relatives, and some of them also came to France 20, 30 years ago to, to visit um, the other branch of their family, just to show that uh, it was not a norm. Uh, and you know, Patriarch Kalustion, for example, in the 80s, um, Recorded all the hidden communities in Anatolia, and he made him, uh, he made it, uh, he publicized the presence of these Armenians, and it didn't create such uh, such an interest among the diaspora. Uh, we have to admit that, and um, no, not so many people decided to to, to work on it to uh, to to get more interest. Uh, even in Istanbul, in fact, you, you, it's not. I would not put the the line between diaspora and Turkey. It's the line may be more uh, between Anatolia and Istanbul. It's uh, there there is a kind of uh, border uh, between. Them. I, I think my criticism is directed less towards you than towards Aisha Gulag, <laughs> but she's not here, so forgive me. Any any other questions? Then thank you to our authors. <laughs>